our final speaker, Tom Nichols. Tom is a contributing writer at The Atlantic. He was professor of national security affairs for 25 years at the U.S. Naval War College and is currently an instructor at the Harvard Extension School and adjunct professor at the U.S. Air Force School of Strategic Force Studies. Tom is the author of The Death of Expertise and Our Own Worst Enemy, as well as books on Russia, the Cold War, nuclear weapons. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Nichols. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Um... Thanks for having me tonight. Um, I thought about uh, when I was invited to do this about this notion that long strange trips um, somehow come back to their origin um, or close a circle. And the circle that I will talk about closing um, only recently happened. Uh, so um, I thought about uh, talking with you about how I ended up um, where I'm, I am now, uh, because, um, like uh, we were talking about, I, our, my speaker was talking about growing up in Massachusetts. I grew up in Massachusetts as well, and I was headed for a completely different kind of life than the career that I ended up uh, doing, which was to become an expert on the Soviet Union and Russia and nuclear weapons, which um, is a lot, was interesting, but it's about as much fun as it sounds. I was I, I started life in a working class town where um, in Western Massachusetts where um, people didn't go off and study those things. They became um, they joined the military. They became doctors or lawyers if they were smart enough, um, and uh, otherwise you went into the trades. And I thought I was going to be a chemistry major. That was my I, I my dad had worked at a chemical plant as a blue collar worker. Um, it seemed like a steady income and something to do, and I was moderately talented at it, and so I went off to college to do that. But I had grown up, the other thing that's interesting to know about my hometown is that I had grown up next to a strategic air command nuclear bomber base. I wasn't really aware of that until I was probably about eight or nine years old, and this is the classic story, of course, about... Um, you know, all us kids hiding under our desks and all of that stuff that we did during the Cold War. But I was the kid who was smart enough to ask the teacher, or I, maybe it's not fair to say smart enough. I was the kid who was aware enough to ask the teacher when I was about nine years old, when we were doing a fire drill, I said, if this is a fire drill, why aren't we leaving the building? Why am I staying in this room and hiding under a desk? Um, and, you know, the answer was, um, that's a very good question. Be quiet. But I, I realized very quickly that I was living someplace that would be in great danger because of events far away with a people that I didn't understand and know anything about. So I, I went off to college still thinking that I was going to somehow measure the thickness of things and um, their viscosity and their temperature and all of that stuff. And I'm about six months into that, I was bored out of my mind. And I just couldn't shake having grown up this was 1979, and I couldn't shake having grown up in the middle of the Cold War next to a bomber base. And I decided to take Russian just to get a, an acquaintance with the language and to see if I could understand something a little bit more about these folks. And I was good at it. And I ended up changing over to becoming um, a Russian studies major. And the next thing I knew, instead of um, stoichiometry and calculus, I was reading Russian literature and um, um, thinking about throw weights and warheads and all of that creepy stuff. Well, the, the Cold War got worse and the anxieties of growing up in the Cold War got worse. Um, I graduated from college in 1983, which now in retrospect is probably one of the most tense years of the Cold War ever. Um, I could give you a whole history lesson about it, but that was the year we invaded Grenada, the year the Soviet Union shot down an airliner um, over um, a Korean airliner uh, over its territory in the Far East. Uh, there was a nuclear alert that none of us knew about at the time that brought us within inches of war. But somehow we could smell it in the air. We all, those of us that were young and particularly studying this, we all had this sense that there was kind of this impending doom hanging over our heads. So I went off to um, New York City to a 
um, a program that was specifically for the study of the Soviet Union. And that meant that you lived with this question every day. And of course, this that fall was the year that a movie that at the time was still the biggest television event of its era, the day after aired. And um, I was just certain that somehow, you know, I was not going to escape having to live through a third world war. In fact, one, one morning, um, I was staying at a dormitory near Columbia University on the west side. And one morning, um, the whole building was rumbling and I woke up from this terrible noise and I opened my eyes and I couldn't see anything because I was blinded. And um, I thought, um, th this is it. It's, it's happened. This is now, and without even knowing a thing about it or why, it just, today's the day. Turns out that I was, um, my building is in the uh, approach path for LaGuardia. And in the morning, those first flights would use the clock tower. Um, if you if you've been to New York City, would use um, they would as a visual marker. They would use uh, Riverside Church as a visual marker to make a turn. And they would come in right over our building and shake the whole building. And I opened my eyes, facing east, and I'd looked right into the rising sun. And it took me about a thirty seconds to realize that, yeah, this isn't right. You don't hear the noise and see the flash. And but that that's how omnipresent it was. I I went off to Washington. Um, to continue my studies in this, um, I, my, one of my first professional jobs was to work, um, in a program that at the time was part of a program, uh, in the defense industry that was working on missile defense and nuclear exchanges and, you know, very Dr. Strange Love kind of stuff. Uh, and that's, I started to have some real doubts about what I was doing. I, I was in a meeting where people would use phrases. I still remember the day around 1986, 87, where someone said, use the phrase, only 40 million people dead. And, uh, I thought you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to say only and 40 million next to each other. It didn't seem, seem right. But, uh, you know, I kind of plotted along and I was, I wanted to go into teaching no matter whether I did, um, whether the world was going to end or not. Um, I, I was by that point fascinated with Russia and the Soviet Union. I'd made it my life. A and then it all ended. It was over. Um, but there was, a, um, there was this omnipresent fear that had drenched through the culture that always stayed with me. And I Particularly, I, I, I should have said, this is also a kind of memoir story about growing up with MTV, which if you're a younger person now is just another channel, but it, for us in, in our 20s was a way of interacting with the culture. And World War III and nuclear war and the end of the world were just omnipresent on MTV. And um, as the Cold War ended, just before the Cold War ended in, in 1985, 1986, Sting, did a song called Russians, this mournful, melancholy song um, with strains of Prokofiev in it, because of course, Thing is that kind of musician, about hoping that the Russians love their children too, and that no one would be crazy enough to do these awful things that, that people like me had been paid to contemplate doing. But then it all ends. I go off, I go off, become a teacher. I go off to Dartmouth College. In fact, I come back to Washington for a year to work in the Senate and what we thought we'd be working on were arms control treaties because the cold, this was 1990, the cold war was ending. We were going to get rid of nuclear weapons. I was happy to be a part of that whole project. Um, that was all derailed by the first Gulf war. Um, it, but so be it. Um, you know, we had a war with Saddam Hussein, the Soviet union fell, all of that cold war stuff and nuclear disarmament all got kind of pushed onto the back burner. Um, and for the next 10 years, we were increasingly obsessed with the Middle East. I went off to Dartmouth, back to Dartmouth. I went back up to the woods and I taught political science and, and Russian affairs, which I was mostly happy to teach as Soviet history rather than current Russian affairs. So I did a lot of different things and I kind of pushed that to the back of my mind. Fast forward <clears throat> to about 2005, I start teaching um, at the Harvard Summer School. I have also begun teaching in the late 90s at the Naval War College. I go from Dartmouth to this military institution where I teach now. And um, 
uh, and I again, these issue, this issue of closure, I'm about to retire, about two weeks I retire um, from 25 years at the Naval War College. But I started teaching the courses on international security and students would ask me, you know, and I would talk about the nuclear period and the Cold War period, and they'd say, well, Professor Nichols, what was your problem? What were you so afraid of? We can even see it with you now. What was this, you know, what was your problem? Because the, the Cold War is so remote to them and all of these things are so remote to them that I became frustrated. And so I asked Harvard if I could teach a course on uh, pop Cold War pop culture, because I thought that was the only way to get through to my students. And um, in fact, I dredged up all of these MTV videos and movies from the eighties and the day after and all these other things. Um, and um, I even ended up writing a piece for the Atlantic um, for people that don't remember the eighties or didn't live through it about how much of the pop culture was completely drenched in this fear. But I, I enjoyed teaching the course because I taught it as this is what I went through. Aren't you glad you didn't go through it? Aren't you relieved? Um, but please understand that people my age who are now making policy, I'm only 61 and the time I was teaching this, I was in my forties and fifties. Um, you know, please understand that this, uh, this experience shaped us, which is why we make some of the choices we make. Um, what I didn't expect was to be retiring and still teaching that course while um, we are in the middle of a major crisis and, and, and a war in Europe um, where we are seriously having to think about all of these things again. And um, suddenly all of the things I taught, I'm almost reluctant to want to teach them again because for me, it feels like having to um, relive them. And I was kind of wrestling with that. Uh, my, I have a daughter now who is, you know, in college and she's the age I was when I started to be really concerned about these things. And somehow I feel like that long, strange trip that took me from being a chemistry major from a working class town through New York and Washington, learning Russia, spending, you know, multiple trips to the old Soviet Union, adopting my daughter in Russia, uh, ironically enough. Um, working for 20 years to try to tamp down the idea that we would face another Cold War, arguing um, against the kind of work I used to do um, and in favor of unilateral nuclear disarmament and all kinds of squ squishy positions that I probably wouldn't have agreed with 35 years ago. Uh, I, I, I am frustrated and stunned to find myself um, back at the starting gate almost and feeling like I have completed not a journey away from something terrible, but having gone through a long circuitous route through a dark and terrifying forest, only to find myself back at the very place I started. And what really capped this feeling for me uh, is that one of my students sent me a link to a song um, a film clip and said, Professor Nichols, you really need to see this. This is pretty cool. Now, when Sting wrote Russians in 1985, he was, you know, 34, 35 years old. If you've ever seen Sting, he's beautiful, um, you know, young man, this, you know, very moving song. And I, I queued up the clip and there was this much older man, 70, 71 years old, um, who had aged like me. And it was Sting. And he had re-recorded an acoustic version of Russians. And I want to read to you um, his introduction to the song before he began playing. He said, I've only rarely sung this song in the many years since it was written because I never thought it would be relevant again. But in the light of one man's bloody and woefully misguided decision to invade a peaceful, unthreatening neighbor, the song is, once again, a plea for our common humanity for the brave Ukrainians fighting against this brutal tyranny, and also the many Russians who are protesting this outrage despite the threat of arrest and imprisonment. We, all of us, love our children. Stop the war. And I, even at this moment, I feel a terrible sadness that I feel like somehow a 35 year trip um, 
has brought me back to where I began. And I'm sorry for that. And I'm sorry for um, anyone who is living through this again, because I really thought it was gone and so did Sting. That's my story.